This video is about thermal energy transfer. It is the fourth video on Topic 8, Energy Production of IB Physics. This topic is part of the core material, so it's the same for SL and HL students. Take a moment and read the success criteria that we will cover in this video. Pause if you need to. Okay, so for the first few slides we're going to go through here, it really is expected that you already have a good understanding of conduction, convection, and radiation. What I'm going to do is focus on experiments that will help us with the theory. So for conduction, we're talking about transferring heat through contact. You can see the picture on the left. We've got a very common example. We have different paper clips attached by wax, or in this case, Vaseline. And as you heat up the end and the heat transfers down the wire, the Vaseline will melt at different times, showing us how far the heat has gone. Whereas on the right, we've got different metals there. And again, we can put some wax at the end and see how long it te takes for each piece of wax to melt. And we can talk about the conduction of the metal. In general, metals are good conductors of heat. This is because they contain free electrons as well as particles. When heated, these free electrons also rapidly vibrate. They can move from the hot end to the cold end of the rod. And when they bump into other atoms and electrons along the way, they pass on the heat energy. This means that the heat is transferred more quickly with the electrons rather than just slow moving molecules. Convection is going to happen in fluids rather than the solids typically for conduction. In the fluids, the particles can move from place to place, and heat energy is still going to be transferred from hot to cold places. Remember, liquids and gases expand when they're heated. The particles move faster, and then they move farther apart. As a result, they take up more volume for the same mass, making them less dense, and then less dense material will rise. Similarly, cooler things, the particles will come closer together, become more dense, they will sink. And this way we'll get convection currents that will be created and transfer the heat. I have a link here to a video where you could watch about the picture I have included. I will add the link into the details of the video. So for radiation or thermal radiation, we're talking about electromagnetic waves, typically the infrared radiation. Every object that has a temperature actually gives off EM waves and usually it's the infrared radiation range that we're talking about. You can see I've got two different examples of experiments that typically happen in this case. A surface that's a good radiator is actually also a good absorber. Examples of this are dark, rough surfaces. So like in the summer, black cars will get hotter. A surface that's a poor radiator is also a poor absorber. Think of why they paint houses white in the Mediterranean. If the temperature of an object is increased, then the frequency of the radiation also is increased. The total rate at which the energy is radiated will also increase. One last thing to point out. Since this is EM waves, remember, matter does not have to be involved, unlike conduction and convection. So if we have radiation as a form of heat transfer, we need to talk about the solar constant. That is the amount of power that we get from the sun arriving toward the Earth. Remember, to radiate means to give off in all directions. The initial power given off by the Sun will be spread out over a larger and larger surface area as a sphere as we move away from the Sun. We can use the equation from our data booklet, love that data booklet, for the area of a surface area of a sphere. Now, if I want the intensity, which will be power divided by area, and if I then put in the values that we know from the average value of the power and the distance to the Earth, it will give us the intensity of 1,360 watts per meter squared. That's what we call the solar constant. That is true for here on the Earth. We can calculate this for each planet. Mercury receives the greatest, Neptune will get the least. 
One of the things I want to point out is our data booklet has 1,360. Many places quote this as 1,400, but on the exam, you need to use the value given as in the data booklet. Now I need to introduce the idea of a new concept called a black body. Now, what is it supposed to be? Well, it's a theoretical idea. A perfect body would be something that would absorb all electromagnetic radiation that lands on it, and also, therefore, if it was then to emit this, as I said earlier, everything that has a temperature will emit it, it will actually give it all back as well. We have this value called an emissivity of the surface. If it was a perfect black body, that means it absorbs it all and then re-emits it all, we would give it a value of 1, whereas something that is the complete opposite with a value of 0 would not absorb any radiation that land on it or release any. So what does this all matter? Well, it's time to do some little bit of investigation on your own. I want you to go to the FET simulation. The link's down below. And I want you to go and explore what happens to the emission as you change the temperature of the black body. Go, t spend some time, play around, I mean experiment with it, and see if you can come up with some, some conclusions before you go to the next slide. So hopefully you found something that looked kind of like this, that at any given temperature, there was a whole range of frequencies that would be given off, but there would be one peak at the graph, which would represent the most intense part of the spectrum that it's releasing. The area under the graph is actually related to the total power being radiated. Although stars and planets aren't perfect emitters, the radiation spectrum is approximately the same as a black body radiator. We can analyze the light from a star and actually calculate a value for its surface temperature realize the core would be greater. Very hot stars would then appear white since a peak will be in the visible spectrum. Cooler stars may appear red that have higher wavelengths and lower frequencies. Planets would be in the infrared section. In general, the hotter it is, the shorter the peak wavelength will be. And we can use Wien's law to actually calculate the peak wavelength will be. Notice the temperature has to be in Kelvin. This is one of those equations that usually gets referred to by name. Another law that gets referred to by name a lot is the Stefan Boltzmann law. It's going to link the total power radiated by a black body to the temperature of it. It's important to note that this is a relationship to t to the power of 4. There's that emissivity value that we talked about earlier. We have a Stefan Boltzmann constant. Yep, that's in your data booklet. A being the surface of the emitter and T being the absolute temperature of the, of the emitter. Again, must be in Kelvin. Here we go. Guess where I clipped that from? That's right, the data booklet. Okay, so let's try doing a question. So the supergiant star Betelgeuse has a surface temperature of around 2,900 Kelvin and a radius of 3 times 10 to the power 11 meters. Determine how much energy Betelgeuse radiates each second. Realize energy per second, they're looking for the power. So let's use the Stefan Boltzmann law. So for a star, we can use emissivity of 1, which is approximately the black body. Then we have the Stefan Boltzmann constant, yep, go find that in your data booklet, times the area of a sphere, again, go find that in your data booklet, 4 pi r squared, times the temperature to the power 4. Make sure you put this in your calculator correctly. You should get an answer of 4.5 times 10 to the power 30 watts. Part B. What is the intensity of Betelgeuse's radiation at surface? Intensity, power over area. So if I go ahead and I use our value from A, 
divide by area, 4 pi r squared again, I'll get the intensity of 4 times 10 to the power 6. Notice the intensity in this case would also just be the Stefan-Boltzmann constant times the temperature to the power 4. Okay, part C. What about the intensity at a location that is the same radius but above its surface? Remember back to topic 10 where they would sometimes give us distances from planets as, you know, twice the radius of the Earth or four times the radius of a planet. Pay particular attention to this. Now, it's going to be twice as far from the center because we are talking the radius of the surface. Its total distance now is going to be 2 times 3 times 10 to the power 11. Calculate and see if you get the same answer I do. Pause now. Did you get the same answer? Remember, going twice as far has actually reduced the intensity by one quarter. So what major assumption was made when we calculated this? Well, we assumed it was like a black body. So what if we assumed that the power radiated was actually not from a black body, but had an emissivity of 0 0.90? Again, pause, see if you get the same answer. Did you get the answer? Okay, so here's the success criteria one more time. Hopefully now that you've watched this video, you can meet all of these success criteria.